Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning uh, and uh, probably good day from somebody. Good afternoon. Uh, we are welcome you today for the side event. Today is the last day of the Regional Forum for Sustainable Development at UNSC region. And we are happy uh, today to host the event this morning. And uh, we hope that more participants will join. And I, in the beginning, would like to remind you, please, if you are not speaking, keep yourself muted. We try to keep this uh, space open for everyone. So uh, we just also uh, rely on your responsibility uh, to take care that everybody can be heard. And uh, so please make space, take space, be respectful to different opinions. We really uh, appreciate also your contributions during the event and we will have Q&A session in the end. So uh, in the beginning, I would like to also introduce myself. My name is Nela Rahimova. I represent Coalition for Sustainable Development of Russia. And, uh, and today uh, we are here with Alejandro, uh, probably you can introduce yourself uh, later. And just to explain uh, for those uh, who are joining us maybe first time, uh, what uh, we are going to do today uh, here with you. Uh, the Summit of the Future, which will be held in September 2024, is a critical milestone for renewing uh, multilateralism and enabling the UN and its member states to deliver on the 2030 agenda in times of multiple crisis. The side event is a uh, uh, the side event aims to bring together UN EC region stakeholders to reflect on the outcomes of the first civil society global futures forum to have uh, been uh, that have been held in New York just last week. The discussion will focus on contributions from the regional perspective to the People's Pact for the Future and the preparation by coalition for uh, UN win. Uh, as a global society uh, contribution to the summit of the future, uh, which is actually expected to be called as Pact for the Future. The side event will be focused on potential partnerships, or so SDG 17, which is uh, this year under review, between governments, intergovernmental bodies, and civil society to achieve the whole set of SDGs. And now I will pass. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alejandro Bonilla. I'm the president of the Association of Former International Civil Servants that are known as GRACELS. It's really a privilege to be here with you and with this very prestigious group. Uh, just a few words about the, the sequence that we're going to follow. We're going to have five short parts. First part is we're going to have the report on what happened in New York. To kick, well, kick the ball and start the discussion. Then we'll have comments from the experts. Then we have comments from the youth, so that this becomes really an intergenerational activity. Then we'll have a second round with the uh, reports from New York, and then we'll move on to a Q&A question. So please start sending your questions as you, as you feel to the chat so that we can have them ready when the time comes. So without further ado, the time is limited. We we'll start with section one, which is the reporting of what happened in, in New York. We have Georgios Kostakos, Executive Director of Fox, co-facilitator, GFF Development Track, Maya Groff, co-winner of the 2018 New Shape Prize, author, among many others, of Global Governance, the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century, and David Wolkam, founder and president of Child International. So please, Georgios, would you be so kind to start and reporting and give us the good news of New York or giving us some, some hope for the future? Please, Georgios, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro and Elia. It's good to be here and it's good to report uh, positive things uh, from New York. I think it, it was a very successful meeting. Uh, we had a lot of people there, at least a couple of hundred people in New York physically. And then we also had um, people who um, were connected online. About 2,000 had registered. 
and the performance they were all attending. So it was a great event. Civil society is taking our future in our hands. And I think it's important to be a balancing power and, and, uh, and richer with ideas, et cetera, of the intergovernmental process. Um, we had uh, a lot of senior people who came to speak to us, which shows that uh, uh, the secretariat with Guy Ryder, who is now the undersecretary general for um, the UN reform and policy uh, in the office of the secretary general, uh, other senior people from the high level advisory board secretariat, also from member states. We had the um, co-facilitators of the process uh, for uh, leading to the uh, SDG summit this uh, September. We had um, one of the co-facilitators of the summit of the future process and, and many more. So it shows that uh, what we do as civil society matters, uh, what uh, we say is listened to and hopefully will help um, bring this hope that we want uh, more broadly to the world. For now, what we have been doing is um, collecting also from the regions. We had another regional meeting, as you know before, uh, you were part of that, uh, from Europe to collect ideas. We had an online consultation that lasted weeks, the actual uh, meeting in New York. And there we came together in our four tracks, uh, seven, sorry, tracks. Uh, we have seven tracks of a policy that we work on. And you have, uh, David also here, who is the convener of the environmental governance track. I was uh, the, con the co-convener of the um, development track. And uh, Maya has been very active in the UN institutional track, right? So we have a, a lot of capacity. We showed it there also with meetings, also cross-cutting issues. And we have now a set of proposals that uh, we took already to some of the member states in New York. Uh, personally, I went to Australia and Costa Rica uh, after the two days of the Global Futures Forum to present our proposals. And the proposals differ. I mean, th there is a variety of proposals. For example, in the uh, development sector, we talk about enriching the SDGs, but without undermining them, without challenging those 17 goals, which have, are serving as well. I mean, we have not been lucky with the pandemic and, and uh, the Ukraine-Russia uh, war and, and all these things that are happening, the poly crisis is not helping. Uh, and we have to do more things to address those issues of resilience of the world. But uh, still the SDGs as a goal and the, the 2030 agenda are for everybody the right framework, which can be enriched, for example, through um, including more interconnections among the SDGs uh, saying more about uh, cyberspace and perhaps outer space, uh, putting more about uh, rights and, and, and peace there under 16, under SDG 16, but still not to challenge the concept and the framework of the SDGs, just to enrich it. Some indicators have expired already. They were supposed to be here earlier in the process. We may need some other indicators. We have some experience that we can improve, but the SDGs remain um, the, the goal and uh, lead us to, to a better uh, future. So that's one of the discussions under development that we had also going beyond GDP, the GDP um, as, a, um, as an indicator of progress and sustainable development is not enough, is not good. It certainly doesn't show sustainable development. So it has to be either supplemented or replaced, uh, enriched, all these proposals exist um, and we, we are working further on them, uh, plus improving the institutional architecture at the global level, but also at the regional and local, national and local levels to deliver the SDGs uh, and a better life for all. So we had discussion on all of these and they will be reflected in the um, People's Pact for the future. We are using the term that the member states themselves have said that will be the outcome of the summit of the future in 2024, the pact for the future. And we say people's pact for the future will be the contribution of civil society. Ideally, jokingly a bit, 
what we prepare will just be signed on by member states and that will be it, but it won't be as easy. Uh, but we want to do a good job and we are already doing it. So there'll be a text uh, which has be started to be worked on uh, with all the outcomes of uh, New York and what we selected from the regions uh, with um, an introductory section and specific proposals that will be, uh, the first draft will be read in a couple of months, I believe, uh, under the C4 UN, the coalition for the UN we need, which is our umbrella organization. More than 100 organizations from around the world supported the Global Futures Forum, and we work together under C4 UN. I don't know if I should go to other indicative uh, proposals from other uh, sectors, not the ones represented here, um, with my other fellow speakers, where, uh, for example, um, we, uh, we want to, to see more about cyberspace and access to, uh, to the internet, uh, bridging the digital divide, safety on the internet, and uh, of course, more participation in general in institutions and more respect for, for human rights for all, a more intergenerational um, cooperation, not only the youth, but also the, the older people, everybody has to be there, but certainly the youth have to co-own this future that they will live more than some of us. Um, other sectors uh, were also uh, about uh, peace and security. We want to see what the charter says, uh, no resources directed towards armaments because that does not allow us to develop in a sustainable way, does not allow us to achieve this better life for all that we want. So we want more disarmament. We want the UN to be more um, capable to mount, if need be, peacekeeping operations with some standing capacity. Um, that's one of the proposals that were discussed and there is uh, support for. And, and for, to close with what uh, Fox proposes, because I'm the executive director of the Foundation for Global Governance and Sustainability, um, a proposal that has been taken up by colleagues also, the Global uh, Resilience Council is a um, council that we believe can be established even without UN Charter reform as a subsidiary body of the General Assembly of the UN and of the assemblies of other uh, agencies of the UN, broader UN system and can be like a security council, quotation marks, uh, for non-military threats, because we see that many of the interconnected and multidimensional challenges of today, like climate change, pandemics, if inequality, the function of the financial system, et cetera, uh, which is problematic, uh, need to be uh, paid attention to and uh, decisions to be made by governments, but also in a very, close cooperation with the civil society and other non-state actors like the private sector without subcontracting to anybody else the responsibilities of governments towards their people and the legitimacy that uh, they have by being accountable to their people. We want to bring in all actors to and all the fragmented system of agencies to really address, for example, climate change. You cannot do it only UNFCC. We have been given a good framework through the Paris Agreement, but implementation is really something much bigger and nobody has the authority as of now to convene the whole uh, system of uh, UN agencies, but also other organizations to actually deliver on what is needed. So that is the proposal very briefly of the Global Resilience uh, Council. And thank you very much for this opportunity. More later. Thank you very much, Georgios, for launching the, the ball and giving us such a wide range of sectors that were discussed and proposals that were presented in, in New York. So now, now let, let's hear about the, the reaction about Maria Grob, who has been extremely active in, in many, many ways and in many fora. Maria, please, you have to floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, and lovely to be here with you. And um, I think uh, I've been involved with thinking about, you know, substantial macro global governance reform very seriously uh, since 2008, where colleagues and I uh, co-won uh, um, an international prize on this topic. 
uh, uh, we proposed a new model, a new comprehensive model to manage our uh, shared uh, global existential risks, which we are now facing. As George just mentioned, we're living in this era of poly crisis. So it's, it's our view that we will have to make substantial global governance uh, reforms or progressive steps forward built on the work that we've already done as an international community. We've become very adept at norm setting, for example, and having you know, really universal norms as represented in the SDGs, the Paris Agreement. We have an extraordinary body now of norms and international law uh, to form the foundation to take the next steps forward. So in this context, um, I really feel like this Global Futures Forum is uh, quite a milestone. Um, a number of years ago, 2008 and, and, and the last uh, five years or so, there hasn't been a really focused uh, civil society international constituency that has been thinking you know, holistically across areas of our international governance. But I think we see this really gelling at this Global Futures Forum, as indeed was the intention of the organizers, the Coalition for the UN We Need, which was uh, put together for the UN 75 anniversary, trying to build momentum within, within the system to really think what is the governance we need collectively as an international community for our 21st century challenges. Uh, given, as we know, uh, some of the very uh, difficult uh, political blockages uh, within the international system. The UN Charter, of course, hasn't been uh, uh, substantially amended uh, in about 78 years now. Uh, so uh, this sort of civil society dialogue and, and raising the bar and trying to push the international community is really vital and important. So just to echo uh, a few things Giorgio said in terms of, of the, the incredible energy and enthusiasm of this event, which was really run on a shoestring <laughs> with very little or, or no budget, but yet you know, over 2000 people registered online, hundreds actually sh showed up and made it to, to New York. And there was excellent engagement with diplomatic representative permanent missions uh, looking for solutions, um, and this is also my experience with governments at the moment, uh, 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 I find are, are much more open to talking about really what are the adequate uh, solutions that we can, we can uh, work, work out together that are equal to the challenges um, we confront. So just in terms of some of the recommendations, Georgios mentioned, uh, well, there's a document on, on the website, there's about 33 different <laughs> proposals. Again, it's very holistic uh, um, uh, across, across the board, different, different areas. Uh, a lot of very important uh, proposals on the funding, the finance, which of course is, is a really key issue for, for the Global South in particular, and, and um, a vital issue for, for climate and of course SDGs and, and truly trying to take some leaps forward in terms of development. But of course, there's then many more structural uh, reform proposals that are very uh, boldly proposed by uh, civil society. For example, a, a earth governance regulatory body rather than fragmented conventional regimes we see in the climate environment area. And this, to have a world environment uh, organization, this is something that, for example, heads of state of France and, and Germany have co-proposed previously. Scientists have been asking for, for, for decades. We have proposals for you know, increasing the parliamentary uh, um, uh, capacity of, of the UN, um, uh, uh, making greater use of the International Court of Justice, um, et cetera establish a global resilience council. So really thinking what is the next generation architecture that civil society can, can really think about and then rally around and have those dialogues with uh, uh, member states and, and like-minded states. So <clears throat> this is very important because of course, some of the greatest breakthroughs we've seen in the international system in the last 30 years or so, but really it's been part of the international system since the charter uh, was, was negotiated before this, this civil society, transnational civil society force that really is fundamental to these, these significant shifts in the international system. We've seen uh, this phenomenon with, of course, the establishment of the International Criminal Court, uh, the Landmines Treaty, uh, the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty in 2017 ne negotiated against very difficult you know, geopolitical circumstances. 
So growing the civil society constituency is actually is, is vitally important. So I think the Global Futures Forum really represents this, um, but will have to be consolidated further and the capacity will have to be built further to think across the international system and, and, and to really think what are the, the really key areas that need to be addressed and need to take these shared norms and values forward in the SDGs, in the Paris Agreement, in the Charter itself. And just one of the more dramatic, uh, you know, structural suggestions of this Global Future Forums is the uh, suggestion to initiate an Article 109 Charter Review Conference, which of course was supposed to be held within 10 years of the adoption of the 1945 Charter. It was not held because of the Cold War and, and other factors. So again, I, I, I feel that civil society is finally responding, again, due to the gra gravity of our shared uh, issues, to this backlog uh, in the international system for like key structural enhancements uh, uh, to, to really adapt to our current uh, intersecting crises. So just to, to end um, my short comments, um, <clears throat> I'd refer for anyone who's interested to our book, uh, in, uh, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020, which is available open access because we wanted to start a dialogue I've also written, I'll put it in the chat, uh, um, a paper on a, 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 a sort of rule of law, international rule of law package upgrade, uh, which I think is actually quite feasible, but alongside, and, and, and I make these points to these other materials because alongside the civil society mobilization and discussion, we also need to, to work out really technical and credible proposals because this is one key barrier also to system change. We have the uh, international, the, 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 the kind of great power or the powerful interests that might block change because of their vested interests uh, or perceived vested interests. I, I don't know if any country can argue now that the current governance system is really serving them. Uh, B, you have to have the, the civil society advocacy, sustained, focused mobilization. And then you have to have really sound, good uh, technical proposals. Uh, that, that can be shared, presented with states and then worked up together in collaboration with them. So this holds a great deal of promise, this event, but there's a lot of work uh, left uh, to be done, uh, uh, work together. So thanks very much, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Maya. Indeed, uh, we are in an era of crisis uh, and of course you mentioned polycrisis and it, it is my call for only changes at all levels, not only the institutions, governments and civil society. Civil society seems to be changing, but uh, I wonder if there's any kind of resistance by governments and institutions to do things that they, ha they have never done before, I'm not sure they've done before. So now, David, could you please bring us back to practice and results and reality? Okay. Uh, well, not reality. Um, but I, um, following on what Georgios and Maya have said, um, uh, let's let's go back to this meeting uh, of the Global Futures Forum. And uh, as they've said, it was the first time civil society has really been back in force at a face-to-face -face meeting in New York, certainly for me, for three or four years. And uh, those of us with gray cells like you and me, Alejandro, will remember the mobilization for the original Rio Earth Summit in 1990. Two, and I think we're at a similar moment here. And as everyone is saying, um, there has to be a massive civil society mobilization to get the changes we need for the United Nations system that we need um, before the UN centenary, um, which is a mere 23 years from now. And this meeting was really a very, very exciting first step. Um, I would say it was really the best civil society meeting I've ever been at at the United Nations in the last 40 years. And one of the reasons for that, um, which was particularly pleasing for me as uh, uh, the president of a youth-led organization uh, with a mission to empower young people, it was mostly led by young people. And uh, it was entirely intergenerational. Um, I was uh, very comfortable with having youth moderators um, using uh, elders like myself as resource people. 
And that youth leadership is paying dividends. Um, you probably saw the UNGA unanimous support of the Vanuatu resolution yesterday, uh, which of course was started by the Pacific Island students. Um, and uh, the follow-up that uh, the young people that I've uh, uh, brought to the meeting um, for, uh, they, they support the People's Pact for the Future, but they're developing a legal pact for the future, which will actually enshrine in law what Mayo is talking about um, for the Earth regulatory body, because the big obstacle is the total absence of robust regulation to support this wish list that we came up with in New York. And whenever you mention um, the idea of enforcement, uh, UN regulars and even NGOs in the New York UN bubble um, roll their eyes and sort of say, forget it. No, it's never going to happen. Any kind of regulation is kind of beyond the board. Governments don't want to have uh, courts that they cannot control. They do not want to have um, any sort of supranational body, uh, let alone the idea of collecting taxes. So although there was very good news from um, the missions that uh, Georgos and I met, um, even the UK mission said, we champion the participation of uh, civil society, which was uh, news to me because they never have in the past. But um, that certainly seems to be the feeling. There seems to be a real understanding that without uh, the drive and energy and intelligence, and new ideas from civil society, especially youth, um, these things are never going to move forward. So there was um, an open door, My, uh, combined with um, uh, the experience of the uh, setting up of the International Criminal Court, Bill Pace from the World um, Federalist Movement was there. Uh, and it was, of course, he who led that coalition to set up the International Criminal Court. So elders and youth are coming together in New York. Um, but what we learned from Guy Ryder was that the Summit of the Future is in a sequence of summits, which, as um, Maya said, started with the UN 75 global conversation, proceeded through the Our Common Agenda, um, and climaxes this year in the SDG Summit, um, moving on next year to the Summit of the Future, and then in 2025, the 50th anniversary of the Social Summit. And I think it's very wise to think of these uh, summits as a sequence, building upon each other. Because what was very clear to all of us is that unless we make a big success of the SDG summit this September, there may not even be a summit of the future next year. People are fed up with governments making promises at the UN that they fail to keep. And the promises of the SDGs have, uh, by any measure entirely being um, uh, failed to be kept. Um, and that was the case even before COVID and the Ukraine war. And what we heard from both uh, the missions that I met um, was that the Ukraine war really has sucked the oxygen out of all other debates at the UN at this moment. And uh, so the the bandwidth for dealing with the um, uh, issues that we want to um, um deal with is is not there. Um, but for me, I think the, um, the, the, the thing that really matters is this global mobilization. And with the team that put together the Global Futures Forum um, from the Stimson Center, from the Baha'i international community, plus um, the hundred um, and growing number of um, groups that come together under the umbrella of the coalition for the UN we need um, is perfectly placed and very, very intelligently led uh, to achieve that mobilization. But I think what we need is a huge boost from all the regions um, to get the mobilization and educational outreach that we need. For example, um, Guy Ryder mentioned a policy brief um, published by uh, the Secretary General on March the 9th about the Declaration for Future Generations. Now, I watched these things fairly carefully, but I'd not seen a line about that. 
And it's a fabulous little document. And there are 10 more policy briefs coming up in the next few months, including the um, Secretary General's statement on uh, progress on the Summit of the Future, which apparently is being released on April the 18th. And these things are just going to gather dust on the shelves unless we in civil society can get out there and, led by young people, I feel, um, get the world's um, community, the international family, to pay attention to them because there are some great ideas there, some of which have been mentioned. I would only mention a few more. They're a bit wacky, but I think that's what civil society has the privilege of doing. Everyone is talking about replacing GDP as a measure of human progress. And I think that if we push intelligently on that, we'll get it. Also, as Maya says, there's a lot of appetite for um, more robust regulation of environmental um, standards. And whether that's in the Global Resilience Council or a parliamentary assembly of some kind or a new earth regulatory body or a strengthened UNEP, these things are definitely on the agenda again. Um, in the peace and security e-consultation, there was a proposal for three new security councils on health, on environment, on, um, I can't remember what the other one was, but three new security councils seemed to me to be quite um, um, a, a bold initiative in the area of the structural reorganization of the United Nations. These ideas can only come through from civil society. So I welcome the success of uh, the Global Futures Forum. I thank you for this opportunity to report back to you. But I really do hope that you all get a sense of the enthusiasm and energy generated by that meeting. And will, as Meyer and I are saying, carry it forward into this sequence of summits that we have ahead of us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, David. And uh, yeah, it's uh, actually really exciting to hear that it's uh, one of the best civil society meetings where you've been. And uh, you actually feel sorry now that I've been there. But yeah, I hope it's not the last uh, possibility to join such events. So I would like to invite now our second, um, no, I would say, for comments. Uh, and uh, here with us today, Paul Lett, Director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. Uh, Gabriel Kola, uh, board member of Women Engage uh, for uh, Common Future and member of Grey Cells. And uh, Cecile Molinier, a member of Executive Committee of Grey Cells. Uh, uh, welcome again to everyone. And we would be happy to hear your comments. And you, according to the program, you have five minutes each. So please, Paul, we start with you. Thank you, Nolia. Um, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you again. Um, UNRIST is an autonomous uh, research institute within the UN system, which makes us a little bit different. We don't have uh, member states in our governance structure. We have a board of academic advisors, and that gives us um, quite a bit of freedom to, to think and to comment and to join with civil society on initiatives um, such as this. Um, given the you know very short time, I thought I would uh, concentrate really on on two issues. One, uh, the SDGs, what happens next, and two, on resilience that uh, Gorgios uh, uh, mentioned. Um, but first of all, to say, uh, I, I, I think I agree with David, uh, we see very much um, the uh, summit of the future next year in a sequence of events that gives uh, a greater uh, potential for realizing progressive change if we think strategically about how these summits link up together and then build on the uh, progress that we're able to make uh, in each one, whether it's on uh, you know, systemic shifts in social protection, decent work in the context of technology or on the concept of um, resilience. But at the same time, of course, we have to recognize this very sobering context that we're operating in, um, uh, conflict, uh, but also these rolling and uh, overlapping crises. Um, but, but first of all, just briefly on the SDGs, um, before I came to Unrest in 2015, my, the last five years of my job in New York was essentially to inform and assist uh, not just member states, but also 
uh, civil society, academics, uh, think tanks, other stakeholders around the world, uh, including at the national and local level, to have their say on what the SDGs would look like. And I took many lessons away from being engaged in that process. And the first was that, you know, in, in an era where there's very little trust uh, between member states, uh, spending time on a process and not thinking that it's a simple linear progression from event to event where you're building and coming up with a framework is a very important way to do it. People got quite sick of and tired of the SDG process, these many, many meetings on the same topics at different levels. But actually what it did in the end was give light to many of the concerns and ideas that came from civil society it kept governments honest at the end of the day when they came to what they wanted to do, which was negotiate a set of new goals in contrast to the MDGs, which was sort of thrust upon them. And it takes a long time. You know, you have to invest time and resources in a process um, that builds that trust and that allows these ideas to socialise and come to uh, fruition and to actually land in a way when uh, people are aware of them and actually own them. I, I would tend to agree that given the sort of paradigm leap that was made from the MDGs to the SDGs, um, it's slightly risky to reopen the whole uh, framework again. And yet, of course, it's very clear that some goals are were rather in, inexpertly put together. If you look at the targets under SDG 10, if you look at the composition of the targets uh, under SDG 16. There's lots of things that can be tidied up and improved. And I would have to note, of course, that not everybody would agree with a, a tidying up process. Some people would argue that the economic governance uh, system that underlies all of it is creating the wrong incentives and the wrong framework that is actually holding back progress across um, uh, the goals. But nevertheless, I think the SDGs are something to protect and improve and certainly not throw away, um, throw away the baby with the bathwater. Um, but that, that sort of links to my second point on resilience. Um, clearly, these, uh, this era of polycrisis has shown how quickly it is, how quickly we can lose previous um, development gains. Um, Many people have thought for a long time that uh, our societies and economies are not resilient enough to these potential threats that may also uh, build in the future. Now, if you go carefully through the, the goals and targets of the SDGs, there are, there are resilience elements in there. And yet, when it comes to implementation and practice, it's very clear, even at the beginning of COVID, that our whole system was, was very, very fragile. Global supply chains for PPE, for, uh, for food, for certain medical equipment, for, uh, eventually for vaccines, were exposed as being drawn too tight and collapsed when it came to countries competing uh, between themselves. Um, it was clear that we had insufficient reserves, insufficient savings. We had not put enough in the bank to deal with crises. And that links to then a tax system which has been uh, eroded uh, in the past four decades, leaving member states with without the resources that they need to tackle these sorts of challenges. An extractive economy, not a regenerative um, economy. So it's certainly clear, I think, that uh, thinking about how to reinsert uh, resilience by having a slightly different economic approach would be quite an important progression if we can achieve it through uh, these three um, summits. Um, and whether, you know, whether that's a global resilience council, or whether it's more focused at the national level through national development strategies, whether it's uh, member states telling the UN system that they need to incorporate a resilience lens into their programming, whether it's uh, the lending operations of the regional or multilateral development banks, whatever it is, something needs to be done to invest in redundancy, to improve taxation, to invest in social protection, um, to make our system stronger for, for future crises. So I think this is a very good direction of travel 
and something that could bear fruit with the right coalitions in civil society and with those in academia and those in the UN who also wish to support this sort of agenda. So, I mean, I, I commend the whole exercise. I think it's great. It's really exciting to see a lot of um, interesting proposals. It's really exciting to see an intergenerational approach taken in the same way, for example, in the SDG process, um, in the major groups, uh, we had coalitions between the youth group and those on aging and elder persons. And I think it's very exciting to see this driven also by young people. And we really need uh, them telling us uh, what we should stop doing now, and what we should be doing instead. But let me leave it there. Thank you very much. Indeed, I think that it's really important what they mentioned, and I think the role of civil society we see through this process is uh, should not be left behind because, uh, yeah, sometimes I'm also as a uh, member of um, MGOS coordination mechanism see that we sometimes really have difficulties. We are still fighting for the space of the UN and uh, some other spaces and uh, yeah, everything you mentioned, I think it's really important that this process is happening and civil society organizes itself and um, we are there in the process. So now I would like to uh, uh, pass to Gabriel. Please. <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for organizing this and thank you for the, the briefing on what's been happening in New York. Um, coming from Women Engage for a Common Future, our, our slogan, our motto is feminists want system change. And when we say we want system change, I think it's not so much about the UN system that we've been thinking, it's more about the global system, uh, the hyper-globalized system with these poly crises in a way, all relating to the way the, the global value chains function and, and, and are profit driven and destroying the planet and destroying us people in a way. Um, so if we take this idea about this, the system change forward, obviously we also need multilateralism to change. So I'm really, really gratified to see how these the, we're connecting, we're seeing civil society being the player connecting all the dots because it is a challenge for civil society, even just organizationally to, um, how do you say, to service, if that's the right word, to service all these different UN processes um, at the regional level, at the global level, the environment processes, the social, social and economic processes, the peace and security processes. And by bringing all of this together with the Summit of the Futures, um, or this, this this forum of the futures, I think we're we're making a big step forward. And I was really happy to hear from David that that you felt that the energy is is back in in civil society, because as we all know, and as as Paul has been pointing out, we we have not just the poly crises, but we have so many member states, which in a way is. <laughs> hindrance to the UN functioning while so many member states becoming so authoritarian. So it's very, very difficult to actually um, move forward on SDG transformational aspirations because so many governments moved away even just from what they were promising in 2015 uh, in terms of social justice or climate justice or, or, or what at that time we thought everyone both at the governmental level and the intergovernmental level, multilaterally and in civil society, we're striving for. Um, so this regression is is a huge. This, this political regression is a huge threat, and I think as has been pointed out, the invasion of of Ukraine has heightened that. But there have been so many civil strife processes um, driven by international geopolitics that we weren't maybe paying so much attention to that are now sort of. In a way, the, the the Ukraine situation is like a like a fulcrum for, for seeing how they all hang together. Um, so, but on the positive side, I think I think this new momentum coming from civil society, connecting the dots, having an intergenerational and also, of course, intersectional. So it's about gender and all its diversity. Um, <clears throat> we and and moving across the different moving across and bringing together the the different UN processes because in a way. You know, the UN is is casting the sequence of, of, of UN summits as as you know all connected, but from the outside they all do look rather disconnected. Why do we need? Uh, I think we're among friends here. Why, if we have an SDG summit, do we then next year need a summit of the future and then a social summit? You know, why doesn't one just really concentrate 
Paris and SDGs and, 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 and keep that track going. And of course, enlarge it because new issues we, we become aware of, but, but you know, why do we need all these? But, but anyway, bringing it all together, I think um, by connecting the dots is a good thing. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to point out um, also is that in terms of this connecting the dots, at the regional level, there's interesting processes underway. Uh, I've been following uh, the G20 People's uh, 20 group. And I think, I think isn't David also part of that? And the, <clears throat> the what's coming together there is saying, okay, G7 and G20, we as UNers want the G194 or 193, we don't want the 20 and the seven, but they are very influential governments. So influencing them as civil society to come back to their commitments is actually a useful lever on the multilateral system. So um, because India is hosting the G20 this year, as, as everyone knows, um, and has been highly selective to put it very politely in terms of the civil society process, the think the T20 and the, the C20 and the women's 20, not letting a broad range of, of Indian ba India based um, civil society organizations participate. There's now a parallel process, which is the people's 20, which is bringing together civil society from the G20 countries, as well as other countries who wish to participate, but also within the Indian subset of, of, of civil society and bringing in the progressive human rights based organizations. And what that particular process is trying to do is actually connect G7 outcome documents, G20 outcome documents, and documents coming out of the UN. So there's a lot of interface with what the what the forum is going to be developing. Um, Another process or another strand that belongs into this discussion is, uh, as, as Maya and others have been mentioning, the need for, for the regulation. And what I think is important um, here is that we need an overarching normative framework, which would be eco-social contracts, is how UNRIS puts it. The UNSG says social, new renewed social contracts. Um, the idea being that the different players, stakeholders need to renegotiate how we actually um, cooperate, coordinate, uh, come to agreements. And so one example of many within this eco-social contract kind of thinking is the process around a binding treaty on business and human rights. Um, positive there is that civil society and some governments of the global south are very strongly pushing for a regulatory um, mechanism of binding treaty, but the um, authorit authoritarian governments in that process are now um, trying to kick civil society out of the pre-negotiations. And so we have to be very, you know, attentive to this. And again, you know, continue connecting all the dots between the global processes and the more sectoral processes. Uh, to come to yeah to come to this different understanding of what multilateralism might be able to achieve and what civil society can be the the promoter of this transformation that we're all looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, indeed, I am actually really happy to hear about this examples how civil society uh, creates space for themselves. And uh, yes, especially for me coming from Russia, uh, I know I know the situation uh, that sometimes, unfortunately, governments are not always providing a space for us. So yeah, uh, and I think in this process again, it's really really important. So um, Cecil, please. Well, no, thank, you, thank you very much and good morning or good afternoon to all of you. And uh, thank you so much for putting this uh, this event together. And it's been wonderful to, to hear from all of you about all of the energy and enthusiasm which is going in, into this process and uh, uh, which will certainly continue to, to build up. I do not bring a specific perspective to, to the debate. I'm just a, a, a member of the executive committee of Gray Cells and I've worked for uh, almost all of my <clears throat> career at, at the UN and uh, what, because of uh, where I worked essentially in uh, development, um, I, uh, 
I was privileged to witness the uh, amazing energy that civil society has been bringing for decades uh, to, to intergovernmental debates. And I think that uh, we are uh, now uh, sort of experiencing the same kind <clears throat> of uh, magic, quote unquote, that we experienced in uh, 2015, as, as Paul and Gabriel reminded us, when uh, uh, in the same year we had the uh, agreement, global agreement on the SDGs and global agreement on the Paris agreement precisely and that also of course as David said takes us back to 1992 which was a beginning in 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 my in my view of a process where civil society in all of its diversity uh, participated on an equal footing with governments in the deliberations that led to the uh, conclusions that were reached at Rio and my my question and I don't have an answer, but I think it's a question I've been asking myself for, for a number of years now, uh, is how can, can we hope to keep that momentum going and actually hold governments accountable to the promises that they have made uh, and which are expressed in those uh, treaties and declarations, which in themselves uh, represent an amazing progress, and most of which were actually achieved thanks to and because of very strong push by, by civil society. I, I would not like the, the work that we have been hearing about to, to remain sort of a parallel track to what governments are currently uh, working on in terms of a declaration that would be adopted, for instance, at the summit of the, of the future. Um, I'm, I'm uh, pretty much convinced that the people's pact for the future, it will become a reality. It will be, it will be endorsed. It, it will be adopted. But how can we ensure that once it is adopted, it is actually implemented. Paul talked to us about the incredible process that led to the adoption of the, of the SDGs. And I think the framework of the SDGs is absolutely amazing in itself. But what we are witnessing now is precisely a, a lack of <clears throat> of engagement, a lack of political will to actually implement it and turn those norms that Maya told us about, those international norms, in, into uh, something that translates into concrete, concrete action. So I think that uh, uh, whatever progress can be achieved in terms of accountability and regulatory, uh, regulatory uh, progress is extremely important because accountability is key and again civil society and uh, when I say civil society I mean particularly uh, heartened to see that youth you know is no longer uh, talking uh, people who are invited to meetings because it looks good, just like women participation has for a long time been uh, tokenism and in a number of instances still is, unfortunately, and it's uh, it's undeniable that it is the, uh, the, the energy and often even the, the anger and the push uh, from young people that has actually been instrumental in uh, pushing ahead a reflection and thinking about what the future should look like. So that in itself is essential. And I'm convinced that that youth leadership that you described for us, David, for instance, will uh, be one of the keys to, to the success of that uh, people's pact for, for the future. But I think it's it's very important, bearing in mind, of course, the limitations and the uh, of government action and the increased uh, tendency of a number of governments to precisely restrict that uh, civic space that is so important. It, it's really important to, um, to build coalitions with a number of governments that are genuinely progressive and would share 
the, uh, the, the ideas and the proposals that are uh, enshrined in the proposed pact for the future, for, uh, for instance. So just like, for instance, when looking back on Sharm el Sheikh, which was uh, more of an empty glass than a full glass, I think most people would agree, but there was still a major achievement, which was due actually to uh, a, a very strong alliance between the SIDS, the small islands developing states and the G77, and in particular, the presidency of, of Pakistan. And that, that push actually led to an agreement, which was inconceivable at the beginning of the meeting itself, on setting up a loss and damage fund. So that kind of progress can be uh, hoped for at the uh, at the summit and at the subsequent summits. But again, the devil is in the details and how can that progress translate into uh, concrete action and, and implementation. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm asking questions and not uh, proposing answers, but uh, I think it's by by being uh, by doing what we are doing, which is to look at processes and at the strengths of those processes, but also at the pitfalls when it comes to implementing uh, what has been achieved thanks to those processes that we can that we can make progress. And uh, again, I'm convinced that it is the, the leadership of young people that will be instrumental. I'm uh, privileged to teach um, uh, in, in the context of, an, of a master course on international relations and the role of international relations in, in global affairs. And my students who are young people, they are in their early 20s, their key concern is uh, what can be done if member states do not uh, actually comply with uh, their obligations under international laws. So uh, this, again, uh, can only be achieved, in, in my opinion, if civil society continues to, to, to play its role as, as a watchdog and keeping governments accountable, as we are seeing even now. For example, at the European level, there are some significant progress that is being achieved at the European Court of Justice and also uh, the uh, General Assembly resolution adopted yesterday that you alluded to is, is also a landmark. So I think there's a lot of, uh, of, of room, of space for, for hope in, in, those, uh, in those partnerships where uh, uh, young people are extremely um, uh, driving, so to speak, the, the process, but keeping the um, alliances with with a number of uh, of governments seems to me to be to be very important. I will stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Now we heard what happened in New York and the reactions from from the experts, and since this is a uh, intergenerational session, we're going to open now the, the floor for, for the youth so that they can share with us what they see for the future. There is a, a, an issue that was mentioned in, during the interventions is the sequence. And it is mentions uh, are made for governments, but if democracy works, uh, which governments will be accountable? Current governments or the governments in 20 years and 30 years or 40 years, how can we make this accountable when democracy works and government will change in democratic countries from one side to, to the other in democracy works. So I think that the, the vision from the youth it is really crucial. And we're really very happy to have with us Ivan Suleinov, who is the secretary to the coordinating committee of Abolition 2000, Global Network to Eliminate Nuclear Weapons. We also have Ulo de Mier, politologist and founding president of the Swiss Diplomacy Student Association. And finally, Sarah Googerly, who is a student of international relations at the University of Geneva. So we'll start with you, Ivan, if you can share your, your vision and your reaction to what you have heard. The floor is yours, Ivan. 
Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for the invitation to speak. Uh, I was actually involved in the European Regional Futures Forum with Manuel Latortora from Graceltz. So we facilitated the event. And then also I got involved in the peace and security track at the GFF as a speaker from the Abolition 2000 Network. So I'd like to you, I'd like to provide um, a very brief overview of the peace and security proposals that eventually were selected to be featured in the People's Pact for the Future and kind of dwell on to what extent, you know, young people were uh, able to have their say in the process. Uh, to me, this, this very strand is very dear since I've been involved with the Abolition 2000 for quite a while and uh, the youth branch of ours, Youth Fusion, that deals with the intergenerational dialogue on issues concerning nuclear nonproliferation, sustainable development. And uh, so talking about the, the process out of probably 40 proposals in the peace and security strand, we had at least three uh, out of six that were chosen to for the pact uh, that included aspects of nuclear war prevention or disarmament aspects uh, that the Abolition 2000 has been working closely on for a few decades already. Uh, one of the proposals addressed preventing war, including nuclear war, and strengthening international mechanisms for the peaceful resolution of conflict. It basically suggested adopting no first use policies to reduce the risk of a launch and warning, also uh, taking all nuclear forces off alert and highlighting obligations under the UN Charter to resolve disputes peacefully. It comes at a very important time now that the G20 statement uh, on inadmissibility of threats or of use of nuclear weapons came probably in December last year. It's also in, in recent and important development that uh, I'm glad and uh, my colleagues are also happy was included in the proposal. Another thing that I wanted to point out is that is the proposal that called for including nuclear abolition in the post 2030 SDGs with the goal of complete elimination by 2045 was proposed by uh, the Hiroshima based organization called Hope. Uh, they working closely on the uh, intersection between sustainable development goals and nuclear abolition, which I believe is the future that uh, a lot of young or young people's led organizations are trying to implement and factor in the conversation at the moment. Uh, one of the most pivotal ideas, in my opinion, was outlined in the proposal to uh, advance human rights to peace, nuclear abolition, and climate protection by calling for its proper implementation in the ICJ and Human Rights Council. Um, since the use of nuclear weapons is uh, and has been proved to be incompatible with respect to the right of life, it's essential that the UN summit of the future and its pact for the future should call on the Human Rights Council to require the UN member states through its periodic review process of their obligation to report on how they're implementing uh, their obligation. And I must say that member states um, have been really sluggish and inert despite really active and vehement NGO pressure. Um, as far as the uh, human right to climate goes, we've had to give, you know, we've got to give credit to the world's youth for climate justice that took the issue of state obligations vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change to the ICJ and David pointed that, that out earlier. Um, I also uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the contributions from young people and among many contributors to the e-consultations that happened before the GFF, uh, some youth statements stood out to me. Several, uh, several organizations rightfully called for the UN to ensure equitable access to mentorship and training opportunities in diplomacy and peace building both in terms of geography, gender, and status. So many young groups uh, kind of aired their concerns over poverty elimination as well, which uh, was eventually presented and kind of tied to Article 26 of the UN Charter on reducing military expenditures for peace, uh, and it was addressed in the proposals. I was also happy to see a lot of young people from various regions directly involved in the sessions um, Youth Fusion that I'm also representing, uh, some of our representatives appeared in the digital compact and the peace and security strands. And I believe the GFF generally did a really good job 
promoting this intergenerational dialogue and kind of drumming up support among senior professionals and young people for, for these much needed steps. So we at Youth Fusion, we focus on youth action and intergenerational dialogue, building on the links between disarmament, peace, climate action, and sustainable development. And I'm sure that the summit is really an important precursor of this deeper and more sincere intergenerational cooperation between both you know, senior professionals and young people across fields, you know, because it's really essential that we hone our ability to see links where, you know, that were not really visible 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. And young people are doing a great job by uh, connecting the dots, as Cecilia probably you put you pointed that out very uh very beautifully. And a lot of young people nowadays seem to really air their concerns about whether or not how cyber uh, security uh, sustainable development, peace and security issues are related. And I'm really happy that the, the summit has given the opportunity to really lean into these questions and provide both, you know, the first and really seek the perspectives of senior professionals and young people who really will have to live in the future where all of these issues will be jumbled up together. Um, I would stop here. Thank you for inviting me once again. I'm really excited to hear uh, from other young participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Um, my apologies, I forgot to mention that we have with us and we have a privilege to have Eunice Kenbiv, who is the regional director of the NGO Youth Parliament for SDGs and fellow of the, at the Clinton Foundation. Welcome, Eunice. And now I would like to give the floor to Pablo de Mier, who is very active here in Geneva at the UN level. Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandro and Nelia. Hello, everybody. Um, so um, I would like to talk about maybe three topics. Uh, the first of one, the leadership, uh, the democratization and uh, reinforcement of youth activities. Um, I think that it's really important, first of all, if we're talking about the UN we want, the UN we need, um, and if you want to improve the UN system, uh, for a better world, uh, we need to achieve this SDG 8. It's really important and uh, we need to be committed in this process, um, especially if the, if the UN wants to show this leadership. Uh, we, we need to improve everything in terms of uh, we need to pay their interns. I want to take an example. When I uh, I was involved in a group, maybe that you know, the Fair Internship Initiative, and uh, when I created the SDSA in 2019, um, one of our first action, because it's really important to be involved as a student in a in an association, but it's also more important to be an actor of change, if you know what I mean. So that was really important to to have the delegations there and to, to try to change everything because it's always easy to criticize uh, a structure or, or, or something like that, but it's, it's really important to be involved and especially when it concerns or it can concern friends um, or if we're talking about the future of the UN. Uh, system so that that's really important that we can work together uh, and through this intergenerational uh, process to exchange ideas how we can uh, find solutions that was for the, the first point the second point <clears throat> is about the UN activities um, maybe to you know in this continuity to democratize the UN activities because I am I observed that, uh, unfortunately, when people are not involved in these fields, uh, it's always, I mean, hard to know exactly what the UN is doing or the representation of the UN, you know, like uh, the, 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 in, in their minds, people are thinking when we're talking about uh, UN or students, the, 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 the big organs, but they're not, they don't know exactly uh, what's happening in different agencies or programs and uh, all the impacts that they really have uh, in Geneva or in the world. So um, 
I think it's really important to, and especially when we're talking about SDGs, SDGs are at the different levels. So uh, local, um, regional, national, and international. So it's really important that people or you uh, can know a little bit more about what's happening concretely. And like that, um, we, can, we can take part of this change. Uh, and the, the last but not least, Maybe uh, it's really important to reinforce youth activities uh, and maybe to add a sort of monitoring because we can see, uh, as you said, Alejandro, I, I was really involved in the associations or uh, diplomatic uh, initiatives. Uh, and unfortunately, well, we can see that uh, many youth activities are existing but it starts and then uh, often it disappears so what can we do it's maybe to add this monitoring um and to to, to yes to to help uh, these youth or young leaders uh in the process uh, like that because you know an association or an initiative uh, can be active maybe one two years but what's happening then you know what i mean so uh the, the changes are inside the structure and outside so we need to take in account uh these different aspects so i think maybe uh, an idea or sometimes uh, when when i was talking to um bachelor students master students or even with a phd uh, students where uh, sometimes the, the 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 reaction was okay we can see youth uh, activities that uh, or activities regarding in the UN but there is sometimes this aspect that um, it, it's fake it's just for a specific point and then there is nothing more so young people are uh, need to be considered as uh, a a person who can reach um how can i say that th th there is something concrete and uh if we want to to be uh, in the changement well we need to work all together but we need the support and i think that for instance gray cells is a good uh, initiative because we're what well, they're doing a lot for a uh, youth and uh, maybe that that could be one of the key of uh, this process to uh, to to help youth uh, in this type of activities. So um, I think that's uh, all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo. Pa Pablo mentioned about the, the leaders and the inclusion of, of, of youth in global processes. I think it's it's as well as important to focus on, on the followers, not only on, on the leaders, because Times are not easy for, for youth. If, if you see all the figures, unemployment is hitting mostly young, young people who are not studying and not working in many parts of, of the world. So how can they be involved and interested in global long-term processes when they're struggling on a day-to-day -day life? So it, it's, it, it's a very important issue how to get them involved and how to balance day-to-day -day issues with the global issues. So, Yunus, please share with us your perspective. Welcome. Yes, Alejandro, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And um, I am pretty amazed by all the insight that were brought here today and I, that I find very sharp and constructive. Um, let me just start by, by by the following statements. I really, I'm I'm very proud to be part of this generation of, of youth that are working tirelessly to make to make a change in in the world. Um, as you all can see, I, young people are creating a change everywhere we look. They are, they are winning Nobel Peace Prizes. They are mobilizing around the climate crisis uh, in ways that puts our national leaders to shame. And if there is one thing that we could say, I think it's time to take us more seriously. Because we are, this, we are dedicating everything we have to tackling the most pressing issues of our time. And we are choosing purpose over paychecks. And our work is really our, our, our life. It's our way of life. So 
young people all around the world, they, they recognize the power of collaboration and unity together. And youth-led organizations that exist at all levels of society and in communities are a testament to, 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 to this. But the challenge here is that the overwhelming majority of these youth-led organizations, they operate without being formally integrated with governmental institutions and without the recognition of the positive impacts that they are having. Um, but I think when we are talking about the, the UN that we need, I think we do need to give credit to, to, to UNCTAD, for example. I am a youth delegate of UNCTAD and I have been part of UNCTAD in many forums. And we are looking forward, by the way, to the, to the uh, UNCTAD Youth Forum taking place in April. Um, UNCTAD has pioneered a new model of networking, of, of working with youth. Um, when we talk about the Youth Action Hubs Initiative, it's resulting in numerous programs around the globe tackling many of the major issues the world is collectively facing today. Um, so the initiative, together with UNCTAD, seeks to empower young people, of course, and to provide the, a working relationship with formal institutions. And that is exactly what we need. Um, youth are calling up, upon governments to formally recognize and collaborate with and involve these youth-led organizations in the decision-making process. And this is one of the fundamental things that we are asking for. We, we need to have an understanding that together we can accelerate progress toward the, the shared goals. When we, when we are talking about achieving sustainable developments, I think that it requires more attention from governments and education in new economies. And therefore, youth urge the member states to allocate especially more, fund, more funding towards research, research on degrowth, for example, uh, ecological economy, decoupling and rebound effects, which are crucial topics to achieving sustainable development goals. Well, holistically, I think a forward looking picture, albeit very slowly, because of the pandemic and many other factors, it points towards advancing a, what, what I like to call a trinity of sustainomics that are encompassing more human-centric public policies, consolidating three important features in my point of view. Um, there's skill development, strengthening the business environments, and when I say this, I'm definitely including capital markets, and reintegrating equitable solutions for cross-cutting aspects within a green transition. I think that these features in turn would foster the efficiency of existing forecasting and monitoring of the global flagship goals. Uh, they would integrate a cluster, a cluster of initiatives intended to, to, um, to accelerate sustainable financing models and, of course, globalization, um, which is the highlight of the interpretation of all global processes at, at, the, at the local, regional, or even international, le uh, international level. Ipso facto, it will leave no one behind. So what we need is a decisive interlinking bridge to, to provide transparency, accountability, and new approaches, highlighting a paradigm shifts in this institutional workings of, of multilateralism towards achieving the, the UN SDGs. Um, I think that what we also need is a clear principle action to be adopted, uh, a focused set of what we call a state-of-the-art value based on the, uh, the, 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 the principles of the UN SDGs. And I think that we need to, to, um, to have the data innovation as part of these targets and evidence-based follow-up. We, we also need, of course, to, to have the, the reviews and the capacity building progresses um, in many domains like social welfare, inclusiveness, um, uh, interconnected governance, uh, a greener economy, digitalization, I mean, you name it. So, Trying to sum up, I think what we need is a new entity that represents a new potential to build back more inclusively, more sustainably, and more collectively together with implementational interventions by uh, experts, practitioners, youth action hubs, uh, civil servants, think tanks, local civic communities that would improve the efficiency, suggesting grace and perseverance towards these human development frameworks. Uh, there's a lot to say, but just to, to, get, to give a, a little conclusion, I think that uh, building a peaceful, sustainable world, it, it's a top priority for everyone. But I think that sincerely, 
use our income bring a gargantuan responsibility in protecting their planets and shaping the world that they want to live in i think it's 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 our modest operandi and it, for me it is my my miss today personally so that's all thank you very much Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, now I actually would like to invite our reporters to react to what we have heard. We are a little bit behind the time. So uh, yeah, and we also unfortunately lost Maya. She had to go to another meeting, but I invite uh, Georges and uh, David to react. And also uh, here with us, uh, Manuela Tortara, Vice President of the Association of Former International Society Servants for Development, Grace South. So yeah, Manuela is also joining us here. So Georges, please. Thank you, Delia. Okay, sure. Very interesting discussion, and it was worth going a bit of, uh, beyond the, the time allocated. I think we are here, a group of people who really care about things. We have experience, more or less, but certainly we uh, try to understand how things work, and we want to bring about a better world. Uh, there is the energy and the goodwill, and I think that's how we can achieve it, by an intergenerational coalition of like-minded people. Uh, it's not a matter only of one or the other generation to, uh, let's say, prevail in this, but really there is so much work for everybody. And of course, the stake of the young people is higher because they have more years to live with the world that we make and uh, we have to help them um, Im improve what we have now. But so in, in that direction, I think, just to add also the regional dimension, Europe, as we discussed also in New York at the GFF, has things to offer as models that we've tried in our, on our continent, like, for example, uh, the interparliamentary, the, the, the uh, parliamentarian uh, representation uh, at the UN, which is a proposal that uh, Andreas Bummel and others have been making for, for a long time, to have a parliamentary assembly in parallel to the General Assembly, so that there is more direct representation of people at the global uh, level. Uh, so that one, we have the European Parliament, Initially, it was appointed by national parliaments. Now uh, it is elected directly. So the, our region has things to offer that could be emulated at the global level and by other regions also. Another thing is, for example, the citizens initiative that is proposed for the global level. We have it in Europe. I think that's the one that helped um, end the roaming charges within the European Union, for example. Of course, for the world, instead of one million signatures, you will need more and from more countries. But there is also a proposal to introduce that so the General Assembly uh, will and the member states will have to respond to such initiatives of citizens. Um, they said the European Central Bank that it does a redistribution within Europe by issuing these special funds uh, after COVID, etc., for resilience and rehabilitation. We could do it with the IMF at the global level. So there are some good things coming out of Europe. I'm adding them to what was discussed because we didn't focus so much on our region. But there are also bad things that uh, the unsustainability of supply chains, the big multinationals that are based in Europe, etc. How do they help uh, really um, create resilience and uh, leave no one behind for the whole world and not just for a privileged uh, West and, and a part of that because also people in the West now, the, the inequalities increase. So we have to remember all those things also. And we, final point, many of us here obviously care about the UN uh, because we worked uh, there, we were interns or we want to work. Uh, I think we should use this special um, relationship we have with the UN to really bring it, uh, uh, bring the global discussion back uh, to our communities because in the past, there used to be the UN associations, there used to be the UN information centers, which in Western Europe, they were abolished all for a central one in, in Brussels. So the, uh, the connection to these processes for the non-experts or the non-passionate ones is not very big in the actual world. Uh, so to, to break our bubble and, and go out there to um, get this discussion going with a broader public. And I think we are on our way of doing that. And that is good. And thanks everybody for all their comments. I've taken them down and there'll be follow up also as much as um, I can. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I just would like to remind everyone before I pass to David that if you have any questions to our speakers, please let us know in the chat because we will have, I hope, some time for a Q&A session. And now I pass to David, please. Yes, thank you. What a, an interesting discussion. And um, thank you, um, Alejandro and Manuela and Nela for including those uh, inspirational interventions from young people. Um, Younes, you are absolutely right. Young people are shouldering a gargantuan task. Um, it is much, much greater than uh, pretty much anything humanity has faced in the past. Um, it's, um, it's therefore quite encouraging to me to see you step up to the plate. But I have to say, um, we've been running Peace Child for 43 years, and the energy of young people back in the 1980s for uh, um, preventing the nuclear threat and ending the Cold War, I found young people stepping up to the plate far more energetically, enthusiastically than I have here in the UK or even around the world, actually. Um, and the, 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 the Greta Thunberg moment is over um, and there needs to be a tremendously much more energetic mobilization of youth. And I'm, I'm glad to say, in answer to um, Cecile's question, you know, how are we going to get the implementation that we need? Because we can make all these fancy promises at the UN, but actually it comes down to you guys to see the implementation. Now, in 2008, a bunch of young people came together in Rochester, New York, uh, to develop a new version of the play, which gives my organization its name. It's called Peace Child. It starts in the future, 50 years hence, when the world is at peace, the environment's on the men, poverty is a distant memory, there's health and education for all and human rights. And it flashes back to the young people of today and challenges them to think about what they're going to do with their lives to bring about that future. Uh, and in 2008, um, they called for a, what they called a kid's strike for peace. And sure enough, 10 years later, Greta did exactly that. Um, so what we uh, and our Peace Child groups in America uh, brainstormed um, during uh, in the margins of the Global Futures Forum was to actually create uh, a new version of Peace Child set in 2070, flashing back to the lead up to the summit of the future, uh, in which um, young people drawn from the P5 member states, um, because I think although we all in this group um, are thoroughly supportive of democracy, we have to recognize that there's, uh, you mentioned the G7 and the G20, you didn't mention the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which represents autocracies. And I think we have to include the entire human family, China and, and Russia as well. And I spent a lot of time in America talking to my Russian friends who are uh, obviously disturbed by the situation, but you know, they have to, the young people there have to think about how they're going to address the challenges that uh, the young people today so eloquently addressed. So bringing together young people from the P5 plus Africa, plus Latin America, plus India and the small island states, so that we get the perspectives of young people all over the world to see if we can come up with a new story for uh, Peace Child about how they actually create the future they want. And uh, implementation enforcement, as I said in my earlier remarks, um, seems to be off the table. We had it for the Montreal Protocol back in 1986 when there were very severe sanctions on companies that continued to uh, use fluorocarbons, but that kind of sanction, the UN is just not capable of uh, committing to. And I think all these other ideas for, uh, you know, I think we should push for them definitely because that's what the world needs. But the ultimate um, leverage that we have is um, withdrawal of our labor. And uh, Guy Ryder, who is from the trade union movement, knows that better than anyone. And what we saw with Greta was um, a fairly pale imitation of the kind of uh, kid strike for peace that our kids imagined back in 2008. It has to be much more robust. It has to be 
we're not going to uh, you know sit in your universities and learn your lessons if all we're going to be able to do is to witness the slow demise of our planet we have got a planet to save that is the gargantuan task that Eunice and uh, Ivan and their generation are facing and I think we as elders need not just to um, promote um, the structures for the UN we need but also build into them the encouragement and support uh, that Greta called for but never got of people withdrawing their labor withdrawing their support until we get the UN we need and I'm afraid um, to, to <laughs> mount the barricades and call for revolution. But I think, you know, we in Europe have that experience and that's what um, we can give to the world. And I think that the leadership um, that Yorgos is saying, good things come out of Europe. Well, I think that that leadership is what we really need to provide. Plus the creative educational techniques and artistic um, expression of uh, what we're looking for that actually we've shown down the years that we can um, deliver. And I think the world needs that leadership from Europe. And uh, I welcome the leadership, the Grey Cells and Fogs and these other great org and Youth Fusion. I must uh, commend Vanda, uh, what's her name? Um, the Czech lady who read the Digital Compact and is also a member of Youth Fusion. That leadership was exemplary. And I'd also like to mention Nadara Yusuf, um, the young Indian who was our uh, leader in New York. Um, such poise, such credibility, such uh, excellent leadership. And I think that that's um, what we need much, much more of. So. I'm going to launch Peace Child's Global Mobilization, but I hope that uh, everyone will join with us in summoning up the blood and pushing forward uh, for the changes we need. Because um, as Maria Espinosa said many times, this is an hour of never moment. And the Secretary General said, this is our last best chance of creating the UN we need. Please, everyone, let's grasp it. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, and I will just direct the pass to Manuela. Thank you very much. Just very quickly, I would like to go back to the key idea of connecting the dots that was mentioned several times here, and particularly connecting the dots between the SDGs with a package that I would call the fourth pillar that is missing in the SDGs construction, which is the package including human rights, democracy, and peace. Uh, this fourth pillar has to be there to enrich, indeed, the elites in the future years. But then the problem is, what is democracy in the new multilateralism that you are envisaging? Do you have a definition for that? And just as a footnote, an important one, less than two weeks ago, the Chinese government convened an, a formal meeting uh, inviting 100 countries that were indeed represented with over than more than three, 300 uh, representatives to discuss the possibility to have different definitions of democracy, various approaches. The democracies have turned democracies, and therefore the question is back to us, as here, the Western civil society and other civil societies of other regions, what sort of democracy do we want to include in the multilateralism and the SDGs of the future? Not an easy question, but please put your brain together because this will be the hot potato in the sequence of events, not only for the summit, but also beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we will have Q&A session. So Alejandro. Yes, thank you very much, Manuela and all the presenters. Now we're moving and we have a few minutes for Q&A. We don't have any written submission in, in our chat, but uh, if anybody would like to ask a question to one of the, particip to the participants. or anybody would like to develop any further element. we we'll still have a few minutes. Georgios, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Alejandro. Uh, I wanted to ask everybody here to think how can we keep the momentum going also at the regional European level? We have our different organizations and our initiatives. 
um, we will continue through the coalition for the UN we need at the global level and occasionally have regional meetings. But can we have something more, let's say, regular at the European level and Europe uh, defined uh, from west to, to east the whole? May I comment? Please go ahead. Um, I actually think that uh, since the challenges, uh, were what I see right now happening, that we, uh, with all these wonderful ideas, we don't engage enough with media, with mass media. Because uh, I think it's really important that we spread this message. I mean, if we want to have this movement, if we want to see youth engaging more, because uh, when we saw this Greta phenomenon, it happened because there was like social media involvement, there was interest and so on and so forth. And I think it's really important that we find the language to communicate to bigger audiences the message. Uh, because... Uh, Every time uh, in our region, we, for example, uh, don't see really interest in SDGs. Media doesn't write about it, uh, about HLPF, about <laughs> regional forums. And, uh, and I think it's really important that uh, maybe uh, we can really think in this direction, how we communicate it more accessible uh, to the bigger audiences, because I think, um, if we want to change the UN system, we need uh, governments to do it. I mean, this is how UN is created. And to create this pressure to the governments, we need bigger audience, at least in the democratic states. So um, this would be probably my reaction to the question. Thank you very much, Nelia. Is there anybody who would like to, to take the floor at this moment? Gabriel. Gabriel, please. Nelia, yeah. Thank you, Nelia. I think, I, now coming back to that connecting the dots, I think for the general public, it is really hard to understand what are these, you know, these, these logos, these pictures about, what is the UN Security Council? Why is it not acting more on for, in instance, the invasion of Russia in Ukraine? Um, but I think such a moment might be the process for selecting a new UN Secretary General, because I thought the one for, um, one for seven billion movement, that was quite, that was connecting all the dots in a way, because that was an opportunity to say, what is the UN actually about for all of us now eight billion people on the planet? And what are all the different issues that need to be addressed? And since that's coming up again in the election process, maybe that would be something like a, you know, a new Greta moment around the UN and what do we need to mobilize different, the different, many different constituencies around a common question. And then it would be all the strands of the UN, multilateralism, the peace, the social, the economic, the, the, the climate justice, gender justice, you know, bringing that together. That might, is one idea sort of off the top of my head. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Anybody else? Manuela. Manuela, please go ahead. If I may, as was just mentioned by Neila seconds ago, governments are in the driving seats, like it or not. I mean, they are the decision makers. So if we do not not only include governments in this civil society process, but also inform them regularly and, and put pressure on them, then the whole process will be a separated one, civil society on one side and the governments on their own. So we have to find a way to be bridges with the governmental level. The parliamentarians are also extremely important for obvious reasons. And the media are an instrument precisely to mobilize both of them. So let's try also to, to find the engineering, the mechanical uh, uh, instruments that will lead to this interaction with the real players uh, beyond the civil society somehow. And it is urgent. It's absolutely urgent. Uh, it has to be done tomorrow. And then the Geneva level is also because we are Geneva based here. We mentioned several times the Geneva gap as compared to the New York vision, New York agenda, New York approaches. Uh, really, there is the Atlantic Ocean in between. So let's try also to build a bridge in the visions that are being discussed in New York and the agendas, which are very economic oriented, developmental oriented, humanitarian oriented, based in Geneva, that are the crucial also for the SDGs improve in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuela. 
Yeah, so thank you very much uh, for everyone to join. We have to conclude our session today because uh, roundtables are starting uh, really soon at one o'clock, uh, the regional forum. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank everyone who joined, who made a contribution to the session. I think it was a really interesting discussion and I'm looking forward uh, to the next steps uh, around the uh, Futures Forum uh, process and uh, hope to see you soon again in reality or online. Just. <laughs> thank you very much, Nelly, and thank you very much, everyone. I would just like to add something for our next, uh, next meeting. I, I just participated in a demographic meeting of actuaries last week, and we had news about youth. And youth is a shrinking part of the world population. If you take a look at the projection from China, they, are, they will be moving by the end of the century from 1.4 billion to 800 million people. And in, in the North and particularly in Europe, the youth is a shrinking part of the, the population. Elderly population, older population is a growing part. It's mostly in the South of the globe that youth still has many, many years in front. So, this brings me to, there's a timing, there's a moment. Current youth that is drinking have this kind of responsibility to, to moving and to shaping things for the future as, as they want it. But also, I think there's also a responsibility to be inclusive. Older people are going to be a very important part of the world population and beneficiaries and actors of the entities. There's a very important movement also to now to promote a convention on the rights of older people. So we should not forget them. I think we were really very well represented and we're represented in race of the older people. And I think in, in future intergenerational activities, we, should, we could have a broader representation of, of these youth movements and older people's movements. Well, thank you very much. I think this was really very, very interesting. And it's just a step. We're going to meet and we'll have different opportunities in the future. Thank you to you all and take care. Have a good weekend. Bye.